Hi everyone, my name is Lizzie and I'm a second year PhD student in the Earth Sciences Department. My research is in the field of active tectonics, which means that I study how tectonic plates move and deform through space and time. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we study these plates and what techniques we use and why this field of research might be important for saving lives. So our first question is, what is an earthquake? I'm sure we've all seen pictures of the aftermath of earthquakes, but what actually causes this damage? In the simplest terms, an earthquake is a release of energy which is built up along a fault plane. Now in this animation here, we're depicting two bits of earth trying to move past each other and the bright colors represent the buildup of stress and potential energy. Eventually this stress is high enough to cause the rock to rupture. And this generates an earthquake as the built up energy is released. Now the plane along which the rupture occurs is called the fault plane. And the earthquake can generate a permanent offset or a displacement across the two sides of the fault. And this can be anything from a couple of millimeters up to several meters for the largest earthquakes. Now sometimes this permanent movement of the ground can destroy buildings, but often it is the energy release and the ground shaking produced by the earthquake, which generates the damage that we saw in the pictures before. This photo shows a really dramatic fault plane in Greece. Now this side of the fault in the back is being pulled away from the side in the front, meaning that the front side is sort of slipping down and away. And this is called a normal or an extensional fault. Uh, the black arrows show how the two sides of the fault are moving relative to each other. And you can see the little uh, geologist here at the bottom for scale. Uh, this fault plane is about 50 meters high. Um, the block diagram here on the right is showing the same process. Now, given what geologists know about the magnitude of earthquakes which tend to occur in this region in Greece, it is pretty much impossible that this fault plane has been generated by movement caused by one single earthquake. Instead, it's more likely that multiple earthquakes happening period periodically through time on the same fault plane have each generated a small amount of displacement, which has added up to build this huge structural feature in the landscape. Now the stresses and strains which generate earthquakes are normally caused by the movement of tectonic plates. Earthquakes can also be ca caused by things like volcanoes or industrial processes like fracking, but today we're just going to be talking about the earthquakes caused by tectonic activity. So hopefully we've seen maps like this before where the surface of the earth is split up into major tectonic plates. Uh, maybe we've heard of things like the Pacific Plate, which covers a lot of the Pacific Ocean. And then here in the UK, we are sitting on the Eurasian Plate. But what do we actually mean when we talk about a tectonic plate? What is it made of and how do they move? Well, there are two main ways which geologists use to categorize the layers of the Earth. And this picture here shows a sort of cartoon slice through the Earth, which is divided up into these roughly concentric layers. So discarding the ocean, uh, the very outer layer of the Earth is called the crust, which tends to be thinner in the oceans and thicker uh, beneath the continents. And then underneath the crust, we have the mantle, which over very long periods of time can flow like a fluid. And then in the center of the earth, we have the core. And this way of dividing up the layers of the earth is based on the chemical composition of each of these layers. So the crust is rich in silicon, whereas the mantle is much richer in elements like iron and magnesium. And the core is mostly metallic, it's sort of iron and nickel. However, another useful way of thinking about the Earth's layers is not in terms of their chemistry, but actually in terms of their mechanical properties. So that is how they respond to stresses or loads applied to them. And the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle tend to behave in a much stronger and more brittle way compared to the lower mantle beneath. And so geologists can clump the crust and the upper mantle together into this layer called the lithosphere, which is basically just a fancy term for a tectonic plate. And this strong, rigid lithosphere moves above the lower mantle, uh, which we can sometimes also call the asthenosphere. And the tectonic plates are moved along because of mantle convection, which is the process by which the mantle transfers heat generated from the Earth's interior up towards the surface. Our next question is where do earthquakes happen? Now this map shows the location of all the moderate to large size earthquakes which have happened across the globe since scientists began to actively monitor earthquakes in the 1960s. And immediately we can see that earthquakes don't occur at random across the globe. Uh, in the oceans, these earthquakes occur in narrow linear bands of seismicity. And these bands actually correspond to the locations of major tectonic plate boundaries. 
For example, this here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which separates the Americas from Europe and Africa. And then we also have earthquakes defining the edge of the Pacific Plate, which is known as the Pacific Ring of Fire. However, something which also stands out from this map is that there are plenty of earthquakes happening on land within the continents, but the pattern isn't anywhere near as neat as it is in the oceans. The earthquakes which do happen on land uh, are clustered, but they're spread out over a much wider area, such as this region here between uh, Europe and Asia. And it's these continental earthquakes which I'm particularly interested in. I look at how the movement of the tectonic plates can cause these broad clusters of earthquakes and then use these characteristics of earthquakes to tell us a bit about how the plates are moving and deforming over time. So what tools do we have to study earthquakes and the surface deformation that they produce? Well, the first and probably most widely known tool is seismology. That is the study of the seismic energy waves which are emitted during an earthquake. Seismology is a super useful and broad field of research, which tells us a lot of information about what's inside the Earth. For example, seismology is used to investigate the properties of the Earth's core because we can't directly sample that part of the Earth. In my research, I use seismology to give me information about earthquakes, uh, for example, how uh, large it was, how much energy it released, how the fault plane is oriented, and what direction the two sides of the fault moved relative to each other. We're all familiar with GPS technologies in our phones and in our sat-navs, uh, but it also provides a really key resource to geologists. GPS stations on the surface of the Earth record how quickly the tectonic plates are moving. For reference, most plates move at about the rate that your fingernails grow, maybe a few centimetres a year. And this data gives us information about how quickly stress is building up along the boundaries of the tectonic plates. Now, uh, INSAR is another really cool technology which helps us to study the movement of the Earth's surface, but instead of looking at horizontal movements, which is what GPS does, INSAR looks at the amount of vertical movement produced by an earthquake by comparing satellite images of the ground before and after the event. This technology can also be used to study the more gradual deformation caused by volcanoes, but that's a story for another day. So a final and more crucial way of finding out the secrets of earthquakes is by actually going out into the field. So sadly, COVID has put my own field work plans on hold. Uh, so these are some pictures that I have uh, stolen from other members of my research group. Um, geologists often go out hunting for fault scarps, which is where the fault plane meets the surface. And if geologists can find a new scarp uh, after an earthquake has happened, then it helps these researchers to match up the earthquake to the right fault and to see whether the earthquake generated a new fault or if it was caused by movement on a fault that we already knew to exist. Now, sometimes these uh, fault scarps just look like a bump or a crack in the surface, but sometimes you can spot them from a mile away. So coming on to the more human aspect of this topic, the big question is, why do we actually care about these earthquakes? Well, this map again, uh, the dots are showing uh, earthquakes that have happened over the last sort of 60, 70 years, and the red dots are highlighting the 20 largest magnitude earthquakes that we know to have occurred throughout human history. The second map shows the 20 deadliest earthquakes that we know of. And as we can see, these two sets of earthquakes don't entirely match up. The biggest earthquakes, the ones that release the most seismic energy, are not necessarily the deadliest earthquakes. However, the one thing that we can say from this data is that the deadliest earthquakes mostly tend to occur on land. So we care about content of tectonics because it affects people. The earthquakes that happen on land do not have to be huge in order to have a devastating impact. So we want to understand more about the characteristics of these continental earthquakes which affect human populations and have caused such great damage throughout history. Secondly, earthquakes control the landscape by forming faults and folds and mountains and basins. And ultimately, the landscape controls human migration and settlement. For example, the Silk Road trading routes through Asia actually correspond very nicely to the locations of major fault zones across the continent. Another key aspect of my group's research is studying the earthquakes which occur in and around mountain ranges. So in most major mountain ranges, we don't actually see many earthquakes at high elevation. The seismic activity instead tends to be focused within the basins next to the mountains. Now, however, these basins also tend to be regions with very high population densities, places like the Ganges Basin in northern India. 
and the seismic energy and the ground shaking produced during an earthquake can be amplified sometimes if these earthquakes occur in a sedimentary basin. And so geologists and engineers want to work together to study these basin earthquakes and to make buildings more resilient to this ground shaking. Finally, there is an old saying in the seismic hazard community that if it's happened before, then it'll happen again, which means that if a region has been hit by an earthquake in the past, then it is very likely to happen again at some point in the future. So by studying earthquakes in these seismically active regions, we can make inferences about the similar kinds of events which might happen in the years or decades or centuries to come. Now, seismologists cannot predict exactly when an earthquake might happen, but we can estimate roughly where they might occur and what kind of effects the earthquake might have on the landscape. And this kind of information can be passed along to other scientists, um, policymakers and governments who will work to make communities and infrastructure more resilient to these natural hazards and ultimately save lives. So to finish up, I'll just briefly talk about what I've been doing during the first half of my PhD. So this map here shows the island of New Guinea, which is this fun uh, turkey shaped island that is just north of Australia. And the green shape on the map shows the extent of the New Guinea Highlands, which is a major mountain range which runs along the length of the island. Now, these mountains are formed because of an ongoing collision between the Australian and the Pacific tectonic plates. This black arrow here on the map is showing the movement of the Pacific plate relative to Australia. Now, we're interested in New Guinea because the mountains are a fair bit younger than more famous places like the Himalayas or the Andes. And so I've been using data from earthquakes and satellites to look at the distribution of earthquakes in and around the mountain range to see what they might tell us about the mountain building processes going on here and to give us some information about the tectonic plates which are colliding together. So the main thing that we've learned from New Guinea is that the mountain range actually changes quite a lot in its properties along its length. And the Australian plate, which is being pushed underneath the mountains, changes in thickness from west to east. And this thickness has an impact on how deep the earthquakes occur, which is the data shown on these sort of cross section plots here. And the thickness can also affect the height of a mountain range. If we imagine a mountain range being supported by a thin, uh, weak tectonic plate, you can think of it a bit like a, a bendy ruler, then the mountains aren't going to grow very tall. But if the tectonic plate is supported by Sorry, if the mountains are supported by a tectonic plate which is much thicker and stronger, like a, a thick plank of wood, then the mountains can grow to be much taller. Now, it takes a bit of time for mountains to reach their full height because these kind of geological processes take place over millions of years. So currently, uh, because the New Guinea highlands are still pretty young, the mountains are roughly the same elevation along the length of the range, around uh, two to three kilometres tall. But over time, because the west side of the mountains are supported by a much stronger tectonic plate, then we have suggested that the New Guinea highlands could eventually grow to be just as tall as mountains as we see in the Andes and the Himalayas. Thank you so much for listening to my talk, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of the Cambridge Festival.